everyone. Um, thank you all for coming for our very first lunch and learn of the year. So thank you. yay, little claps in the chat as well. <laughs> My name is Emma and I'm the volunteer coordinator at Mississippi Park Connection. And I have the lovely um, opportunity to introduce our speaker of the day, Jess Loeffler. She's a biotech of the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, where she leads our Monarch Larvae Monitoring Program, as well as habitat restoration events with our volunteers. Thank you, Emma, for introducing me. Um, I'm excited to talk today about our Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project. So just a little bit about me. Um, like Emma said, my name is Jess Loeffler. I'm a biotech here at Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. A little bit background about me. I got my bachelor's in biology with an emphasis in ecology and evolutionary biology. And that was at uh, Minnesota State University of Moorhead. And then I got my master's in environment and conservation science over at North Dakota State University. Um, throughout my academic career, I've had um, an amazing opportunity to work with some really cool wildlife. Um, I was hired on as a lead researcher in many different projects, um, spanning from anywhere from radio coloring, radio coloring squirrels. Uh, we got a lot of weird questions, um, but it led to great conversations. Um, to waking up um, at five, six in the morning to go canoeing out and checking out basking traps that we created for painted turtles. Um, and it was just an amazing experience. And so that transitioned into my master's program where I looked, I was out in the Appalachian Mountains looking at songbirds. Uh, specifically, looking how physiology influences lady and orange eyes in dark edge juncos. So, as far as professional, I've held a bunch of different seasonal positions um, with many different organizations, spanning from a couple of different states Minnesota, Virginia, um, Hawaii Island, and uh, North Dakota. And so that brings me here to uh, the Park Service. So, last year, as as I was a master's student, I signed on as a student guide. And since then, I've become a biological science technician, primarily working in habitat restoration. And so last year was my first year leading the monitor monitoring program. And I've been really excited about it. Um, it was such a cool project to see and be a part of. And so I'm excited to share with all of you um, what our monarch uh, data looks like. So let's dive into monarchs and talk about them. Sure. Oh, yeah. You bet. Sorry, online, uh, the screen was not shared. There we go. Um, so monarchs are pretty commonly known, especially with their natural beauty. Um, they have, um, they're a big staple in the uh, community and in ecosystems. So for example, they're a primary food source for, for some organisms. There are two birds in Mexico that uh, it makes up their diet about 50 to 70 percent. And so it's really, really important as a food source in the ecosystem, but also as a pollinator. So these in their adult stage um, of the monarch butterfly, they will go around and pollinate our prairie lands. But they're also significant in uh, they have cultural significance, especially in Mexico, as they're believed to be a symbol of connecting the living to the dead. Another strong connection that they have is education, especially in youth. So one thing that a lot of uh, teachers will do, will have a, some type of unit on either entomology or um, some type of life transformation. So I was just curious of people in the room and online, um, how many people had either reared, uh, reared monarchs in school or at an education center when they were younger? So by show of hands, or if you're online, you can do any reaction. That's quite right. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> 
So I'd say about 90% of the people yeah. in the room. Um, I didn't see, or I didn't show on my screen for the online portion, but um, that's pretty, pretty in, um, incredible. Um, it's pretty uh, amazing how monarchs, especially, I mean, if everyone attending here is most likely interested in monarchs or natural resources. So it really gets a foot in the door of um, getting out in the wild. So let's learn a little bit about their life cycle. They have four main stages. First, starting off with the egg stage. So females will lay anywhere from 300 to 500 eggs, and um, they primarily lay on milkweed. Well, they only lay on milkweed, as their uh, larval stage will, will rely on that as their primary food source. And so these females, um, they like that quote, don't lay all your eggs in one basket. These little guys will hatch around three to five days old, depending on temperature. So what, during warmer days, the temperature, when the temperature is warmer, uh, they tend to have an increased, increased process. And on cooler days, it's going to be more around five days as the process is slowed. So next phase of their life is their larval stage. And the entire larval stage in monarchs lasts from somewhere between 9 and 14 days under normal summer conditions. And so now uh, this photo is the largest larval stage, but there's actually five different stages that they go through. Starting off being a really tiny little uh, speck in the world, uh, they're pretty distinguished with their black head and their grayish yellow body. Uh, the first food source is going to be their egg, uh, their eggshell that they'll eat, and then they'll, they'll start their strict diet of milkweed. And so when we're monitoring, you'll typically see a small, um, uh, small cutout in the milkweed in the middle of the leaf. And then as they grow bigger, they'll start uh, branching out. And so each, each stage, they will molt their skin, and then they'll grow new features and um, exaggerate that color pattern. So that color pattern is pretty familiar in the wildlife community. When you have vibrant uh, yellows and oranges, it usually means, hey, I might be toxic. Um, so it warns predators of toxins. And that's because milkweed is actually toxic to many species. And so they have a little bit of defense against some predators, um, but some of their natural predators are immune to, uh, immune to this. And so they'll grow to, when we're monitoring, we'll monitor uh, for each stage of the larva. Of the larva. And once they get to their fifth stage, we will start uh, leaving milkweed looking for a place to feed it. Also, uh, one thing I wanted to highlight is only about 5% of monarch monarchs will make it to this fifth stage. And they're not even full butterfly yet. So it's pretty um, pretty hard life to be a little a little caterpillar. So um, after they are in their fifth stage, they'll go out and try to find a sturdy area, typically on a branch. And they make that signature J shape that many people are familiar with. And uh, the larva will hang upside down and spin a silk uh, mat from its spinneret, which is kind of near the head. And then in this in this stage, they'll grow their wings and other adult organ, uh, organs, and they'll continue to develop and um, in this chrysalis stage for about 10 to 14 days. So until they become a beautiful butterfly, um, their adult lifespan is typically around two to five weeks. And I have a little asterisk there because um, there is a generation that survives longer, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. So they made, made this huge transformation to get to only living two to five weeks as an adult, uh, which is pretty crazy. 
So as an adult, their primary goals is to drink nectar and pollinate. Um, they roost, they reproduce, and repeat and repeat um, throughout their lifespan. And so when it comes to adult monarchs, um, they are actually sexually dimorphic. So there's a couple of differences in them. The male will have uh, these two black dots on their hind wings, and that's typically they'll release like a chemical pheromone during uh, breeding season. Where the females on this left side, you can see that uh, they don't ha have those black dots. Mm. Um, this photo is kind of hard to see, but females do typically have uh, more bold black lines on them when compared to the male, and sometimes a deeper red, reddish orange. Um, their abdomen also can vary, but it's kind of hard to see when they're just flying by. So the best way to tell is uh, the two black dots on the male. So uh, next I want to talk about their migration because it is pretty wild. So there, I just want to preface that there are two populations um, here in the United States. One uh, Western population, they live west of the uh, Rocky Mountains. And so they do a shorter migration from like, Canada, um, migrate up and then migrate back. But we're not going to focus on that population. We're going to focus on this um, eastern migration, uh, mostly because they're the ones that come to Minnesota. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this later too. But they will like, or they will overwinter in Mexico by the millions. Um, and so the, there's some really cool photos coming up here. So what's interesting about them is they have a multi generational um, migration pattern. So um, when they overwinter in Mexico, they will start migrating up and start laying that first uh, batch of eggs. And so these uh, these adults will then die off and the next generation of eggs will um, survive and then make their way up again further north. And so this, these species will live two to five weeks again, reproducing um, reproducing and then their eggs will grow up, migrate north and repeat and repeat. So it takes about four to five generations for them to actually get here, which is pretty incredible. And so when they are here, that's that last generation. Um, and what's really special about the eggs that we find when we're monitoring this season um, is that they're, they're gonna have if, if anyone's heard like Minnesota born, like strong, hardy, um, maybe I'm just biased because I'm from here, um, but they're actually pretty hardy as they can live to be, um, they can live up to nine months because they have to make that entire migration back down to Mexico. And so where they overwinter and then start that next generation. And so they'll fly um, between 2,500 to 3,000 miles. And so I was thinking about this last night, laying in bed, and instead of going to sleep, I was like, uh, you know, things that you think about at night. So this is equivalent to a, uh, if you're thinking body length to uh, distance ratio, it's equivalent from a rob for a robin to fly all the way to the moon and halfway back. <laughs> and so I was thinking about that and I was like, this is pretty crazy, but what about humans? So I'm here I am pulling out a calculator in the middle of the night. <laughs> human equivalent. So uh, the human equivalent of uh, body rate length ratio to distance would be about a 210,000 mile journey and traveling about 3,500 miles per day. So these monarchs will migrate anywhere from sometimes 20 miles, sometimes 100 miles every day. I couldn't imagine going, you know, maybe 10 miles max for me. Um, I can imagine doing 100 miles a day, let alone our body weight ratio to 3,500 miles. So this is what keeps me up at night. <laughs> so uh, that last generation, of course, coming back down to Mexico. So how is the Eastern monarch population changing over the past 30 years? 
So um, I wanted to talk about how they do monitor for these uh, monarch populations. So they actually look at total area occupied um, in hectares. So when I mentioned in Mexico, um, they gather by the millions. Sometimes um, they estimate about 21 million monarchs per hectare. Wow. And so when they're in Mexico, they have they take a plane and fly over the OML uh, or forest and they'll do a population survey. <laughs> And so on the y-axis here, we have the total forest area occupied by monarch colonies. And then on the x-axis, we have that winter season um, by years starting in 1993. And uh, this was actually updated this week to the 2004 population. Um, so we get to see some brand new data. Mm. Uh, so this is what the general trend is looking like between 1993 and uh, 2024. And as you can see, it's not looking very good. Um, it's a pretty uh, general trend downwards. Does it have a laser pointer? You won't see it on the TV. Okay. So. Okay, um, so it's a pretty general trend downwards. Um, which is pretty sad. Um, we're seeing this in a lot of different species, but especially in insects. So we, we've we seen about an 80% loss in the entire population since 2005. And that was, um, so that was in 2005, but you can see the general trend was already spiraling down. Um, so in, 20, uh, 2014, on a national level, we did an addition to list these species and as endangered, but it wasn't accepted, uh, primarily not due to the fact that they are declining, um, just that there are other species that are more critically endangered um, and need more immediate help. And so in, after after the new news about their population now, they're going to try, the USMP Wildlife is going to reevaluate that those numbers and see if they should be on, uh, listed as endangered species, whether it's vulnerable or endangered. Um, also, one thing I wanted to note is this um, reddish orange line across the middle of the graph. So that's about six hectares. And that's about the that's the estimated population that it's needed to fully sustain itself. That's what scientists believe that if they're below that threshold, they probably won't be able to sustain their own population. And as you can see, um, we've been below that threshold almost entirely in the last like twenty years. And so I was also looking on the international level um, of, of these species. And in 2021, they were actually listed as endangered, but that was retracted in 2022 to uh, relist them as vulnerable. And again, not due to the fact that their species are growing, it's due to the fact that other species are taking priority right now. So, big question, why are these populations plummeting? So, uh, monarch faces many different threats. Um, some include habitat loss, chemical treatments, climate change, introduced species, and natural enemies. So, I'll kind of uh, talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, as far as habitat loss, we've lost about 96% of prairie habitat in the United States, leaving about that last 4%. And that's pretty drastic, especially for a species that uh, lives out on the prairie. And one thing to especially make note is this, this species is a multi-generational migration. So that means that they need, they need their primary habitat in every state throughout their migration. And so if any state doesn't have that perfect habitat anymore, it makes an incredible cascade where if the first generation doesn't have enough habitat, then um, then they'll see less numbers and less numbers will be able to migrate. 
Another thing are insecticides and herbicides. Pretty self-explanatory. Insecticides um, have been uh, targeted or can target uh, the any state of the monarch, but also the herbicides. They've seen issues with growth of milkweed. Um, there's a bunch of studies on that, but I won't go into detail on those. Um, but those are some issues that they're running into. And of course, climate change is a big factor for many, many different species. Um, these species rely on environmental cues for reproduction and also for migration. So environmental cues have been uh, changing, especially with the change in the climate. And also changing the climate has influenced unpredictable weather patterns. And when you're a tiny, like four inch insect, it's really hard to live outside with unpredictable weather patterns. Uh, introduced enemies, whether they're predators, parasitoids, or diseases. I uh, highlighted two here, um, whether they uh, could be plants or animals. One plant I wanted to talk about that's thankfully not here in Minnesota, but they, it's been coming across the East Coast, uh, I believe Michigan and Kansas State, is black and pale swallowwort. So it is a European milkweed species that's made its way over here. And so our female females have uh, noticed this milkweed species and have started laying on them. Well, unfortunately, they don't carry the substance that the, that the larvae eat. And so when the larvae uh, hatch, they have no food source. And so they've seen a lot of die off due to that. Uh, another thing was a pretty traumatic experience that I found this summer. Um, this photo was taken by myself. Um, I was excited to take one of our rangers out, our seasonal rangers out last year, uh, Cassie at the Science Museum. Like, it's really cool. I definitely saw two larvae here last week. Maybe we'll see something cool. I mean, that's pretty cool to see, but um, we only found one larvae that day, and this is what it what it was. Um, but this is an introduced species, a uh, paper wasp. We have a few different wasp species here um, that are introduced, and they predate on the larvae. Um, but it ended up being a beautiful day, so no worries. We were we were all happy. Um, and then, of course, they have their natural enemies, um, predators, parasitoids, and diseases. So how are the species doing in our park? So we, are, we monitor our species through the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project. And this project is a, a joint partnership between University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, their mission is to better understand the distribution and abundance of breeding monarchs and to use that knowledge to inform and inspire monarch conservation. And they've had over 20 years of publications um, spanning from contributions of citizen science, survival ship rates, uh, parasitism, natural enemies, temperature effects, agriculture impacts, et cetera. Um, they have over uh, uh, 20 plus publications um, due to the research that we have been doing at our park. So uh, what does monarch monitoring actually look like and what does it mean? So a lot of times it's like a needle in a haystack. Um, well, actually it's even more difficult than that because it's a living creature. So if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you can't just search um, blindly. Um, it's very methodical. And so Monarch Joint Venture and ha has a list of um, trainings that we have to take before we go out. So a lot of times some of our places will look like this middle photo where um, there's just hundreds and it's a little overwhelming. So we monitor in two ways. One is uh, transect. So instead of monitoring all 300 of them, uh, we'll do a transect through it and monitor just some of them. Um, the other thing is when they're more widely dispersed and less dense, we'll just monitor the entire population. And so on the far, the far one, you can see two eggs uh, that was laid on that milkweed. And then in this one, um, how many people spotted the larva in it? Can you spot it? I'll, I'll point it out uh, on the screen. I wonder 
I probably can't do it online, but it's directly in the middle. So, and this is a stage five in star. And so the fact that um, it's hard to see at its full size, it's really hard to see in its really tiny form. Um, but we have incredible volunteers that help us um, uh, manage all this milkweed. Um, so we have forms and they um, take regular me measurement data uh, like uh, which instars were seen at which stage, if we're seeing eggs, adults present, um, whether aphids are present, which um, uh, and different, I believe it has different species on there that we monitor for, and then what's blooming around us, um, especially when it comes to seeing the adults emerge. So we have six different monitoring sites here. I'm going to see if I can do this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, it's yeah, not sharing. OK. Actually, I think I can. It's sharing on there. OK, this will just be really awkward for the people in the room. Um, OK, so we're going to look at a first site at North Mississippi. Um, so this is our site. If you're familiar with the area, we have our paddle share station, um, and it's just north of the Cronian Nature Center. Um, one thing that was uh, unique about this site is that we used to do over the years, we were monitoring at this lower site here, um, but it uh, it has a bunch of Canada thistle. So in the last couple of years, they've been doing a lot of um, mowing and different techniques to try how to um, get rid of Canada thistle. So a few years ago, our volunteers showed up and there would be nothing but cut grass. Um, so we decided to stop monitoring there and so last year was the first year that we wanted to still monitor in the area but we just picked a, a new area and so that area is about three uh 3.62 acres okay the next down the chain is mill runes park uh wait for that It looks a little different right now. <laughs> um, so it's right across from St. Anthony Falls. Um, this one actually has the most milkweed we have seen. It's one of the smallest sites at 0.2 acres, but it actually has one of the most uh, abundant milkweed, which is really cool um, for a small little uh, plot right in the middle of Minneapolis. So there we go. There's St. Anthony Falls. Uh, next, we have two plots at Coldwater Spring. So the first one um, is what we call the parking lot plot, which, as you'll soon find out, is surprise right next to the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, so this area is about half an acre of monitoring, and that's one of our longest monitored spots. In addition to a small pollinator plot here that's just south of the um, of the reservoir. And this one's a little bit smaller at 0.2 acres. Next, we come over to Minneapolis or to St. Paul. Uh, we have two spots that are kind of near each other. Upper Landing Park is one area. And that's about 0.6 acres, and it's a wide stretch. And then we have the Science Museum. And the Science Museum was also added this year. Um, it was added because I was out on break one day, and I was just enjoying. They have a little nature spot. And I saw an instar, and I was like, what? This is so cool. <laughs> and so I was like, well, Break time over, and so I was just casually looking, and I found two in one site. And for our monitors, our mo for our volunteers, they'll know how pretty significant that is. But a lot of times when we go out and monitor, uh, we'll find nothing. 
So sometimes it'll be weeks of nothing. Sometimes um, we'll find maybe one egg, maybe one instar, but to find two in one day, that was just serendipitous. Um, so for some reason it's not loading, but it covers the entire section of these three plots. Um, pretty, pretty small area again, um, 0.12. But I am gonna ruin a surprise, but it did have the most activity out of all of them as far as eggs and larvae. So that was really huh. cool. Back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Success. <laughs> Okay, so how are each spots doing? So uh, North Mississippi and the Science Museum were technically only one year worth of data. Um, so they're gonna look a bit different. I just put them in a bar graph. And we have the quantity and number on the y-axis and then the life cycle on the x-axis. So this is what we found at North Mississippi this year. We found two eggs, one instar. Uh, the one instar in the photo uh, that was really hard to see was actually from here, so that was a really cool sighting. Um, this this site also had the highest number of adults seen, um, which was really cool to see. I think every time we went out, we saw at least one adult. The milkweed is primarily common milkweed and butterflyweed and world milkweed here, um, and their milkweed density was about 96 when we did our milkweed con uh, milkweed population survey. So the other one year data again was the Science Museum. Um, and this is what we found. Like I mentioned, uh, this had the highest number of eggs at 16, which blows all of the other places um, out of the waters, which is really interesting because if you remember what it looked like, it was a very small area. Um, so I'm wondering if those uh, could be multiple things, but I'm curious if the female was just primarily focusing on that area to lay her eggs and then before moving on. Um, so 16 eggs were found, six instars, and two adults. The next one is we'll go to Coldwater Springs, starting at our pollinator plot. So now this is across several years. So again, we have that quantity number on the y-axis and the year um, years going across the x-axis. And so I have them color-coded. Eggs are blue, larva state is a pink, uh, adults are yellow, and milkweed is green. And so this is the general trend at our pollinator plot. And um, anyone who's interested in stats, um, I didn't run any fancy stats, but I looked at the R-squared value, um, and a high R-squared value means that um, there's some type of um, so there could be some type of statistical significance of the general trend. Um, that's about as far as in stats I'm going, but uh, so eggs and milkweed, I put a little monarch above it to symbolize that they had some type of, um, they might have some type of statistical significance. And so you can see our pollinator plot lost a lot of milkweed um, and seen, we saw a lot, a very small amount of adults there. And I just wanted to make a note of this too, is this is the first year that we monitored world milkweed and I couldn't find it in the notes prior if world milkweed just wasn't found there or if it just wasn't, um, wasn't documented. Because in all the other years, world milkweed wasn't documented at any other site. So I'm assuming this is the first year we've just monitored that. So if I were to just do common milkweed and butterfly weed, uh, this last dot in 2023 would only be around 10. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot further drop than we expected. So what about our cold water parking lot spot? It's actually pretty good, um, relatively, I should say. It's pretty stable looking at um, the milkweed and all the stages of uh, the eggs, the larvae, and the adult. Um, so that was starting monitoring from 2016 up through last year's data. Upper Landing is another site we've been monitoring. So this one um, had some pretty interesting trends. So um, milkweed monitored this year was a lot higher, which is weird because a lot of our sites had lower milkweed. 
but it is right by the river. So I'm wondering if that has an influence um, as far as dam. So one thing I was thinking about for our cold water plots is we did face two years of extreme drought. And so I was talking to Neil too, and he thinks that that may be a factor of why we're seeing less milkweed. <laughs> But being right next to the river, at least it gets extra moisture. So um, we don't see that similar trend at upper landing. Um, we did see a general trend down in larvae, but it didn't seem, um, we'll see in the next few years to see if that's significant or not. Uh, Melbourne's Park was next. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know in this, I had to transform the data because uh, there, we monitored about 150 to 200 milkweed species. And so uh, it didn't fit on the graph. So I just log transformed it so it looked better on the graph. Um, so uh, I just wanted to also note that in 2013, we had two rangers instead of one person monitoring. So we doubled the efforts. And so in this in the graph, you can see that we did find more eggs, but I'm not sure if that was due to uh, higher efforts or not. Um, that would be a statistical analysis that I'm not going to go into. Um, so, but we did see an increase in eggs and adults this year. And so um, those are all, all of our sites at the park. And so I also wanted to put together a graph of what uh, what's happening generally in Minnesota. Not looking too good either. Um, so the general population, I mean, the R squared value wasn't too high, but uh, so you could say stable, stable slash declining. And our national population is steadily declining. So um, I think, I mean, as a park at our, at our sites, having mostly stable and declining is a lot better than some places. So um, what are we doing to help monarchs? And maybe what more can we achieve? Um, we've had a lot of conversations about how we're going to revamp this year. Um, and here are some suggestions that we might be implementing um, over maybe the next couple of years, I should say. So I, the top three I had in mind were education and spreading awareness monitoring populations and conservation and restoration. So the first is education and spreading awareness. Um, in, in order to know that you need to conserve a species, uh, it's kind of important to know what a monarch is and why we need to conserve it. So education and spreading awareness is a huge key. So something like doing a lunch and learn about monarchs is important. I know during some habitat restoration events, when we have them at some of our sites, I'll talk about monarchs and our program and how they're doing. Um, and I know some rangers will include and incorporate monarchs during uh, any of their ranger talk, ranger led talks as well. Um, so, Um, another a further bullet I wanted to uh, potentially go into is maybe partnering with different agencies. Uh, we definitely already do partner with agencies, especially as um, those a lot of those sites are on partner lands. Um, but Ka Ranger Cass and I last year had the amazing opportunity to go over to U.S. Fish and Wildlife at the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge and take some butterflies. And so we were given nets and they said, go and net some butterflies. And I felt like a five-year-old child and <laughs> I smiled for the rest of the week. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, so we, we both ended up, we ha had a volunteer with us too. And we both, we all ended up catching a butterfly. Uh, we brought it to the station and they were putting these tags on them. So it's a very small thin sticker that they put on the wing. And that way, um, each one has a unique number designated to them. And so as they start migrating down, they'll have other stations or even the public can, if they see a tagged monarch, they can say, oh, we saw number 2643 in, uh, say, Tennessee this week. And then they can calculate how long their migration is doing and maybe pinpoint some of their migrational patterns. Um, so it's a really cool program. 
I don't think any of our sites, I'm like, maybe North Mississippi could have a high enough population to actually tag, um, but maybe maybe we could do some tagging um, with some of our partners. Uh, the next one is to monitor population. Of course, uh, we're continuing to monitor the populations through our park. I just want to highlight this awesome photo that our volunteer Elizabeth had of a monarch flying across the cold water spring. Um, I think after like two two photos of them, and it it was perfect. Um, so what some of those moments where you're just like, oh, I'm here for a reason. This is the sign. So I looked at the map to see how many how many spots are actually being monitored around here. And this is what it looks like. Mm. And my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, wow. OK, it's being pretty heavily monitored. But that actually wasn't the truth because I went into each site and I found out that majority of them didn't have any data on them. Mm. So um, you can register. A lot of people will register their backyard plot, be excited and monitor for, for a year, maybe two years. Um, but then not update it, you know, for a 10 year span. And so a lot of these data points will have, um, you can either mo monitor for one time a year. So, um, so some of them have one data point, some of them have one to two in a year, um, but not long-term data. And so one thing we could do is um, add more sites along along the river all the way down and up north to get a better estimate across the entire 72 mile stretch um, instead of just six sites. So maybe adding an extra extra site or two for long term data purposes. And of course, conservation and restoration, um, definitely important to um, definitely important to conserve a species and so i know at uh, we're doing a lot of restoration and conservation our entire crew is working every day out there um, so one thing i was thinking about is focusing on restoring some milkweed populations in order to do so we have to know a little bit about the milkweed we have so we have four different species here we have common milkweed swamp milkweed world and butterfly um, that's the four species in the uh, Northeast region that I have personally observed in our uh, corridor. So um, how are these species using, um, using them to lay eggs? So a study done in 2018 that looked at all of these species to see which ones they were laying eggs on. And they found uh, um, the highest in our region were common milkweed and swamp milkweed. And they saw a low, low amount of eggs being laid on butterfly weed and world milkweed. So what about larval survivorship? That's pretty important too. To, I mean, only 5%, but that 5% is pretty important. The good news is here in Minnesota, all four of these species have high survivorship. There is, I just want to make a note, there is one more species of poke milkweed. Um, I haven't observed it in our area. It's more Southern Minnesota. Um, maybe it's observed elsewhere in Minnesota, but I haven't seen it in our corridor. And then, of course, the adults uh, will have been known to pollinate all four of these species as well. So it's important for them as a food source, too. So overall, um, these are the three bullet points I've been primarily focusing on, and they or they will try to combat all of these threats. So I pulled up that previous slide with the horrifying wasp feeding the larvae, just to remind you of which slide that was. Um, so as far as habitat loss goes, we're tackling that um, by conservation and restoration, obviously. Um, chemical threats would be great in education and spreading awareness would be a really um, key factor in combating that threat. Climate change uh, can be uh, all of them. Monitoring population, you can see how climate change affects them. Uh, conservation and restoration, and obviously spreading awareness um, about climate change. And maybe help combat some of the threat. And then uh, introduce enemies and natural enemies um, goes with all three of those bullet points too. Um, education, spreading awareness of these introduced species, and their natural enemies, 
monitoring populations. We do monitor for introduced species and other species found on the leaves. And then obviously conservation and restoration. Uh, we spend a lot of time removing introduced species um, and restoring their native habitat. So we are doing a, a lot of work here at the park. So I just wanted to give a special thank you to all of you for being here. Um, and a special thank you to all the rangers who have helped and the volunteers who have helped in the past, um, because we definitely wouldn't have been able to monitor all this milkweed um, without, without all the help. And so this is a reel I created that was on our social media page. So please enjoy. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering with us, we are going to look to recruit some volunteers. Um, whether you're a new volunteer or um, repeating volunteer, I'll probably send out an email to repeating volunteers later. Um, but yeah, thank you all. I, if I'll open it up to any questions, thoughts, I don't know, jokes. Um, if anyone's in the field, uh, it'd be great to hear suggestions um, for maybe future projects or partners. I have a quick question. Can you hear me? I've never done one of these classes before. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. Hello? Uh, do you have a question? Katie? I do. I do. Um, I just brought some property up by Moose Lake and last summer noticed along because it's a dirt road that um, tons of milkweed because I've been raising some here at my house when they fall in my lap. but. The milkweed was just filled with caterpillars. One of them had 13 of all different sizes. And then the next day, the city mowed the street side. So is there anything I can do or legally with them to say, hey, let me, let's protect this stretch of the road until they're done? Uh, first of all, that's really awesome that you saw so many caterpillars. That is, that is wild. Um, as far as legally, they're not federally listed, um, but one thing you could do is talk to the, I mean, if they're doing maintenance on the road, talk to the township that you're in and right. reach out to them directly and because they might have an interest of conserving, um, conserving these species. Right. And, and I guess the other question that goes hand in hand with that, if I were to build like a, a screened in porch, say the size of a milkweed that's three feet tall and one foot by one foot. So other other things can get in and out and weather to protect them. You know, if I stake it to the ground, is that a yay or a nay? Because I'm assuming they would just get eaten all so quickly. Yeah, that's actually a common question that we've been, um, that scientists have been researching. If it's uh, pros and cons of rearing, uh, rearing monarchs, um, and of course there's pros and cons of both of them. So there's no uh, specific data that says absolutely you should, or no, you shouldn't. Um, so it's kind of up in the air on if you should or should not, uh, focus on that. Maybe I'll just move the plants off the street and put them in the middle of the property. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can plant some more and they're, they're pretty hardy. So in the uh, fall, when they start budding, you could. Um, manually grab a couple and just plant them in and I bet by next year they'll um, if they're by the road and happy I'm sure they'll take up to your uh, your area too yeah 20 feet away okay great thanks so much you were wonderful <laughs> thank you, Katie. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Amy LaFrance is still on she had a question about um, a group of monarchs from South Carolina I'm guessing uh, in SE uh, there's a link to it I don't know if I'm guessing you probably didn't do too much setting up on South Carolina populations, so but we can always follow up with you later, Amy, and take a look at that that link. So, what was the question? It was a there's like a link to um, refuge for monarchs and Sparks Discovery. Uh, it Ooh. some link we can uh, we'll get to you later on that on that, Amy. We can respond to that one later. I don't know if we have any information on that right now, so. Um, Kathy was asking about uh, if we were monitoring at the Minnesota National Wildlife Refuge, Fairman Valley, uh, near the Bloomington Airport. I'm guessing that's outside of our corridor, so we probably weren't, but they were probably had their own site for monitoring. Is that 
but it looks like there's a bunch of them in the Twin Cities area. Yeah, um, so we don't specifically, I'm not sure. I know that Minnesota Valley is doing the recapture program um, that I showed a photo of earlier, but I'm not sure what their monitoring process is. Um, Lori was wondering if you had any recommendations for the best mix of milkweed or butterfly weed for attracting monarchs, and does it make a difference what we plant? That's a good question. Um, so I know a high diversity area will attract more monarchs, but also a large quantity of milkweed will um, attract them. As far as, I mean, we talked a little bit about whether they're laying eggs and survival ship back in this it'll take a long time to get back to that slide um so uh, my my advice would be to plant a diverse amount of both um and also other native species to draw in pollinators and what i would say like what timing are like the adult monarchs in minnesota for like the adults and making their oh, way yeah. back not south to what's flowering and what's available for a food source for not just the milkweed but for the adults as well so yeah so some early species that pop up uh because they will start arriving um usually in may um so some early species and then late blooming species too will be important for our generation that's going all the way down to mexico Sometimes they'll come down from Canada to Minnesota too. So it'll be through their journey. Uh, I don't think Kay had a question. She was just saying that anyone can order Monarch tags from Monarch Watch and tag Monarchs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is. Nice. Thank you for commenting that. Um, Those are some great questions. Let's see. Mark McLennan, uh, there is an interesting new paper discussing the status of monarchs and suggesting that people rearing butterflies and releasing them is not so good for monarchs. Tropical and other non-native milkweeds popular for landscaping are implicated for the decline of monarchs related to uh, OE parasite affecting monarchs. So then you also have the link to that article. So that's good news. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. So, uh, Scott. Um, do you know of any research that studies where population attrition occurs along the my, uh, monarch's migration path? Can, can you repeat that? Um, do you know of any research that studies where population attrition occurs along the monarch migration path? So any particularly bad areas or hazardous areas as they migrate, I assume? Um, I don't know off the top of my head uh for that question but there might be some out there um i can take a look and follow up with you too i think some of that would depend on like weather patterns and stuff too with like other migrating species like it just depends if there's a big storm or they get caught off guard that's that can be fairly i know that can be hazardous for other species migrating but i would assume that's the same for monarchs All right, Len had a question. Um, I've seen hundreds of monarchs on uh, Mexican sunflowers at the Arboretum in the fall. Is it worthwhile to plant that flower? That's really cool. There's hundreds. Okay, well, I know where I'm going this fall. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, uh, native sunflowers are always gonna be really great, um, especially because they do tend to bloom in the later season. And so we will get that, um, uh, especially for that last generation that's going to be moving so they can grow up big and strong. I think it'd be a good idea to plant some native sunflowers. Um, Kathy was saying Minnesota Valley was actually tagging the monarchs. So, yeah, so thanks. And then he says, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, I don't know, does anyone in the room have any questions? I think we got two couple minutes up. Um, so in the summer, is there, for the adults, it's a mix of migrants coming from the South and Minnesota born uh, butterflies, is that correct? At some point, their populations will overlap mm -hmm. because we have the early arrivals, um, 
who I don't know how you travel so fast to get there, um, but they'll lay their eggs and then that generation could be starting while the next wave are migrating up. And so they can uh, overlap. Okay, cool. And when do they leave or like start leaving for the south? Uh, they'll typically leave August, September. One thing that was interesting about this year is we saw a lot of emergence um, or butterflies coming here earlier. Um, so that could be another interesting study with effects of climate change. Oh, and I think that's everything. Feel free to email me um, or Miss Volunteer and, and it'll make it my way mm -hmm. if you have any questions. Thank you. Oh, Beth, that was great. Thank you all for yeah. joining us. Yeah, I didn't know about um that one that one parasite that you mentioned earlier. 